Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 19 of the True Crime All the Time podcast. I'm Mike Ferguson, and with me, as always, is my partner in True Crime, Mike Gibson. Gibby, how are you tonight? Hey, man, I'm doing really good. Good. I'm glad to hear it. I don't know what I would say if you said you weren't doing good. Well, I, there you go. So at least I'm saying I'm good. <laughs> That's good. So Gibbs, I think we're ready to jump in. Are you ready to tackle what I be- is basically our first cultish case? I don't even know if that's a word, but that's what I'm going with. Yeah, yeah, it is. You know, what, what gets me is this is a case that I think you've wanted to do from the very beginning. Yeah, I've had some interest in it for a while. Yeah, from the start of the podcast, you kept saying, when are we going to do this? When are we going to do this case? And that time is now. All right, so let's tell them what it is. Yeah, I've been waiting to do this one, Mike. I've been waiting to uh, do the uh, Chicago uh, Ripper Crew. It, uh, when you're doing some research on some other projects, it caught my eye, and I couldn't turn away from it. So, But it's, it's very interesting. It's very bizarre. It is. And like I said, I think this is the first one that we've done that you would call a cult. Yes. And I've seen it mentioned a couple different ways, Chicago Rippers, Chicago Ripper Crew. Right. I think we're going with Chicago Ripper Crew. Kind of sounds good that way, I guess. But basically, I mean, this was a satanic cult and a group of men. Yes. Four people. They were suspected in the disappearance of at least 18 women. At least. At least. All of this happened in Illinois In a pretty short time frame, we're talking 81, 82. Yes. So you've got Robin Gecht, you've got Edward Spritzer, and then you've got brothers Andrew and Thomas Cocorales. The (laughs) Cocorales. We're going with that. Yeah. I'm hoping that's right. Yeah. So there's some interesting ties about this case that I think we almost have to start out. And and that's really what grabbed me the first time I looked at it. Right. I think it was. Yeah. I I remember you mentioning that. that. So Robin Gecht, you would call him the leader. Absolutely. Of the group. He is for sure. And Robin Gecht had worked for none other than John Wayne Gacy. Yeah. The killer clown. I mean, and that's crazy when you think about it and we're going to talk about it a little bit more too, but Basically, what what it appears is that is that after Gacy was arrested, and we haven't done Gacy yet, we're kind of saving him because he's definitely a big timer. But so after Gacy's arrested, Robin Gecht, it's almost like he formed his own gang or cult. It is like that, yeah. With these three other guys. All right, so let's let's dive right into these four a little bit. Again, we're going to focus on Robin. Because he was the de facto leader for sure. For sure. But all four of them were born in Illinois. Robin, born in 53. Edward and Thomas were born in 1958. And then Andrew was born in 1961. So, again, if we're talking about the time frame, you know, Andrew's 20-ish, 1920. Ed and Thomas are just... 22, 23 years old. And then Robin's quite, you know, not quite a bit, but he's older. Sure. By far, he's the oldest of the group. He's 28, 29 years old. Something like that. When a lot of this takes place. I don't have a ton on Robin Gecht as a youngster, but what I did find Gibbs was some interesting stuff. And, you know, you and I like to talk about early lives. We do. Because we, I don't think there's any doubt that it plays a factor as you look at and see what these people do as they get older. As a youngster, Robin was accused of molesting his own younger sister. And then as he got a little bit older, but was still in his adolescence, he developed an interest in Satanism and secret rituals. Wow. Oh. There which goes. is going to play a huge role huge as we as we move forward and it was also reported that i think i don't know if all of them but a lot of these folks had a fascination with abusing animals right which we've talked about many times there's a shocker yeah 
So, you know, we probably don't have as much info on these as, as we do in some of our other episodes, but there were definitely some red flags on some of these kids that, you know, they had issues in childhood, which we see on almost every episode we do. That's Yeah, we do. We really do. And then for him to to work with Gacy on top of all that, you know what I mean? Yeah, so I mean let's let's talk about that. Robin was employed by one of Gacy's companies called PDM Contractors. And a lot of listeners are gonna know a lot about John Wayne Gacy. Obviously, he's a very famous serial killer, but John employed a lot of boys in in some of his various businesses that he did. Now he also killed a lot of these boys. He did, yeah. That was his thing. I mean, he was into young boys. There's there's no doubt about that. But one thing that Gacy would claim is that he did not kill everybody by himself. He talked a lot about having an accomplice. And there was also some evidence, I think, that there were times where he couldn't he wasn't even in the city when some of the young boys were killed. And it basically made it so that he could not have committed some of these murders. Now he killed a whole ton of people. Oh yeah. But you know, there again, is that Robin Gecht? You know, apparently from what I read, they, you know, Gacy was having some of these boys put the lime and, and do some of the, not construction work, but some of the the work to cover up some of his crimes. Yes. It's unknown whether these kids knew what they were doing or not, or the extent that maybe some of them had even participated in some of the murders. Yeah. And I think, you know, I read that Robin Geck thought that Casey kind of went about it the wrong way. Right. I mean, he, he talks about how, putting all the bodies in this Casey's backyard uh, or his know, crawl space, or his crawl space basically yeah. was his biggest mistake. Yeah. Which I think you and I have talked on about some similar in other episodes. Why store all the bodies? Yeah. You know, uh, going back to uh, her Baumeister. Right. Exactly. Why store all the bodies in your backyard when, a lot of these people get away. And again, we're not telling how people how to get away with murder, but you know, spread your stuff out a little bit. Don't, you know, keep, keep your business away from your house. <laughs> I hate to say that because I know. I'm but, definitely not. I don't think I'm telling anybody anything they don't know. Right. Right. But I mean, so, I mean, for him to make that statement tells you that I, I just think he knew a lot about what happened. Yeah. It's just the extent. What, yeah. how much did he know? Now, the argument to be made against that is that Gacy liked young boys and we know that Robin Gecht didn't. Right. We're going to see by his murders that he had a totally different MO or a totally different um, but just, target. Just as he, as you find out, he controls his group. I'm sure Gacy had a way to control his own group. Yes, I would agree. But either way, whatever the facts are, it's it's more than coincidence, right? It has to be that these two guys worked together and would go on to cr- commit such crazy crimes. Yeah, it's not like it was an apprenticeship. Yeah. Well, well was what it? was it? <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, we just don't know. It, it just seems like it's so much more than coincidence. And I found this quote from John Wayne Gacy, and, and I thought it was really interesting. I think this was from a letter that he had sent Robert Ressler, and, and Ressler's you know, famous FBI profiler. And basically what Gacy had said is, you cannot hope to enjoy the harvest without first laboring in the fields. And there are people that have come out to analyze that and, and say, you know, is Gacy predicting that his young 
followers or accomplices would eventually become serial killers. Maybe. Yeah, maybe he mentored them to... And there's a reason why he didn't kill Robin Gecht. Because he killed just about everybody else. Yeah, and Robin would have been a, a, a young boy yes. at that time. Yeah, definitely. So, a very interesting tie-in. Like you said, I know it's one of the main reasons that kind of piqued your interest into this oh, case. Oh, it did, for sure. So, like we said, we, we've got a cult, a group of, of four men... Now, the first victim of this cult gang, gang cult, whatever you want to call it, is was 28-year-old Linda Sutton, abducted on May 23rd, 1981, behind this hotel in Chicago called the Br'er Rabbit, which is kind of a strange name for a hotel, but apparently it was a well-known place for sex workers. Okay. Now, her body would not be found for, I think, about 10 days, Gibbs. Yeah, that's about right. And we should preface that what this cult ends up doing in all of these crimes is almost unimaginable, some of this stuff. So, you know, again, content warning. We probably were getting ready to get into that part, but yeah, it's brutal. It is brutal. There's no way around that. I mean, Sutton was gang raped. She was sodomized, and her left breast was cut off while she was still alive. Yeah, mutilated. And this is going to be a signature. It is a signature for this cult. We, we're going to see this in, I think, every one. So again, that, that was their first victim. So they found her out in the field in Villa Park, which seems to be a, a theme with them also. Yeah, there there is... Um, a lot of bodies that seem to be found in that general vicinity. But then they take a break, right? It's close to a year, I think, before they start up again. Right. Actually, it's almost exactly a year because it's May 15th, 1982, when they abduct Lorraine Borowski. And she is abducted just when she's getting ready to open the realtor's office where she works. And from what I understand, it's employees that are coming in to work, right? You know, after her, she's obviously the first opens up the the office, the office, the criminal acts happen. Right. And then her coworkers stumble along. They find the office locked. What they also find are her shoes and her her purse and just everything's scattered. Scattered about the parking lot. Yeah. Yeah. So not a good sign. No. They know something's wrong. But again, her body would not be found for about five months. And it was found over in a cemetery in Villa Park. Villa Park. But again, with her, they gang raped her. They beat her. They took a wire, wound it around one of her breasts. Why she was still alive, and they kept tightening it until eventually it cut through and cut the breast off. I mean, this is pretty sick. Well, uh, it, it is, and you know, let's let's play a clip because, like we said, this this breast mutilation is a part is a part of their mo. It, it, it happens in every incident that we're going to talk about. So right. let's play this clip. It's determined by the pathologist that the path of entry in this particular case was through uh, stab wounds uh, in the body, the upper torso. Her breasts, it turned out, had been removed. We would have no clue what removing a breast would mean. You don't think about people actually intentionally removing someone's breast. There are three reasons why someone might remove a body part. One is it's a paraphilia, which is a deviant sexual practice to somebody gets aroused by unusual objects or activities. The other can be symbolic in that they're removing a body part that's representative of female, for example, in order to then do something with it that will empower them. And the third one would be to as a memento or a souvenir from the murder. If you see a lot of brutality that's anti-mortem, 
They want that person to suffer. They want to humiliate that victim before they actually kill them. So that's an added component to the fantasy. They want that person to understand psychologically that they're going to get battered and bludgeoned and hurt. There's going to be a lot of pain before they're murdered. This is a person who's usually angry, probably has been humiliated somewhere along their life. Forcing a victim to take drugs is one way to keep them from screaming, uh, also to keep them pliant and, and easy to control so you can keep them stationary and perform something like using a piano wire to slice off a breast. He probably tried different things and looked at different possible weapons before he settled on the wire. And the wire, of course, if you hold it taut, is going to slice through all kinds of things. And it's going to be a weapon that isn't going to be obvious should somebody come into his home to do a search, who's going to think the piano wire is what was used. So Gibbs, some good information there, right? She talked about the paraphilia, right? which we know there's no doubt that's what we're talking Absolutely. about here. Yeah, this is exactly Sexual is. gratification from you know, doing what they're doing. The other thing that, that I really took away from what she said was the drug part. Mm -hmm. Because when you, when you think about it, they're doing this stuff while the person is alive, right? How are they, how are they doing that? How, how are they accomplishing that other than to have either knocked them out cold yeah, and they're not doing that, right? They, no. They, they want them alive, awake, so they can see the pain on their face. Right. By all accounts, and again, some of this comes up later, but we know yeah. that that, again, is part of their MO. Right. That That's part of their, I don't know if you want to call it sexual enjoyment. Gratification is for the victim to be awake, to be responsive, and to be seeing what is happening to them. Right. And so how else would you do that unless there was some type of drug involved that made these victims uh, pliable or, or compliant or something like that? I believe that like just kind of like we had with the toy, you know, the toy box killer. Yeah. So I, I like that part from the clip because I think it it helps fill in some of the the gaps of right. how are they able to do some of these things? But it was just, you know, think about it. They, they get Lorraine, they take her back to the hotel room, right? We've already said that they gang raped her and they beat her and they took the wire around the breast and cut the breast off. And then according to one of the other participants, uh, writes her that Gek actually had sex with the breast and then when he was done with that, then they went ahead and they took a hatchet or an axe to her and finished her off with that. And killed her. And killed her. And again, we're, we're going to talk about this, but it's not solely the act of cutting off the breast. No. Because they end up using these body parts in ritualistic... Yeah, they save the breast. ...fashion. Yeah. And it's the breast. It always right. is the breast. And... All right, so we got to jump along to the next victim, and that is a, a Chinese woman named Shui Mac. So on May 29th, she was abducted. Yeah, just a couple weeks later, right, from, from the one that we just talked about. Yeah, she, so, was, she was coming back from her, uh, family, her family's restaurant in uh, Streamwood, and she had been riding with her uh, brother in his car, but they had they got an argument, so he uh, dropped her off while she was waiting for a ride with one of the other relatives. That's about the time that she got. Yeah, my understanding was her brother thought that the relatives behind her would just pick her up. Oh, okay. One and the, something uh, <laughs> happened, and either they weren't behind them like he thought. And he kept on going. Yeah, so imagine, you know, obviously this guy has to feel... Yeah. Horrible. I'm sure. Not his fault, but they got in a fight and, you know, they made a, made a bad decision there. They abduct Shui Mac. They drive her to an isolated wooded area. Again, they rape her. They cut off her breasts. They slice her body just in every possible way they can. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a brutal scene to think about. 
and then ultimately they bury her in a hole. Yeah, over in a construction site over near Villa Park. Now, I think we know that they're taking these breasts with them because we're going to talk about that. Yeah, pretty soon. Pretty soon. But, I mean, it's 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 one thing to point out. They're not cutting off the breasts and leaving them there. No, they're, they're collecting. They're collecting these for a very special reason. Now, her body would be found around September 30th. So, again, what you've got is the police dealing with some similar killings and... The link is pretty obvious, I think. You know, how, how many murders are you going to find where a breast or both breasts are cut off in the in a similar manner? It's not going to happen very often. It's going to be kind of rare. So I think they put this this one together pretty quick. But they're not... They had a really difficult time finding leads. But that tide turns a little bit, Gibbs, when the next victim comes into play. Yeah, about 2 weeks later. And this one uh, this woman's name was Angel York. Or I should say is Angel York because she survives. Yes. And she's able to report that two men using a red van abducted her, held her inside the van with handcuffs and they raped and tortured her. Now, what else do they do? They force her to use a large knife to cut her own breast. Yeah. How sick is that? So they've gone from doing the cutting themselves to forcing their victim almost like in a saw, a movie saw, if you've seen that. Right. Pretty disturbing. Yeah. I, I Again, I don't know how you get somebody to do something like that unless it's just complete th- threat of you know if you don't do this i'll kill you or i mean it has to be because that pain you would think has to be excruciating you would think so it was said gibbs that this act of her cutting her breast drove the men crazy yeah yeah i think we mean crazy i think like lustfully yeah it was a turn on yeah which i i'm not seeing it but uh you know again I don't think our minds are working like theirs were working at this point, but one of the, one of the guys ends up cutting her some more and then he masturbates into one of the open wounds. He does. Yeah. It's sick. Well, it is sick. And then he closes the wound with duct tape Yeah, and they dump her out on the street. So again, I'm not sure why that is. Why, why they killed, you know, the first victims and then they did this to her. I don't know if they thought she was dead when they dumped her. I'm thinking maybe that's what they thought. Okay. So this was in June of 1982 and she's able obviously to report to police what she saw. She's able to give some type of descriptions of the individuals involved, but it's not enough at this point to really lead them to any of the cult Chicago rippers. Yeah. We'll say. Not, not, not enough information. No. The next victim was a teenage sex worker named Sandra Delaware. And she was found stabbed, strangled to death on the bank of the Chicago river, August 28th, 1982. And again, her left breast was com- cut completely off. Right, yeah. So, they, they, I mean, they found her uh, wrist bound together behind her with her shoelaces from her shoes, and and uh, they also said that she was strangled with the uh, her bra knotted around her throat. The trend of them, right? The left breast. What's so special about the left versus the right? So it's really not much more than a week, week and a half later, that 31-year-old Rose Davis is found in an alley, basically having suffered the exact same type of injuries as Sandra Delaware. So it was about Rose Davis, it was said about her that, you know, being a businesswoman, she was pretty independent and she's really outspoken. 
and to the point that she was also pretty tough, that she would be hard for them to just to grab it. She would put up a fight. I did read that. Yeah. Her friends all said that she would not have gone quietly. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when they did find the body, they found a black sock that was tied around her neck. Of course, her clothing was a disarray. And then that she was found in a pool of dried blood um, that was underneath her, you know, anal cavity. So we know that she most likely she was raped. And then her face was crushed beyond recognition. Found her in the alley. And she had deep cuts across her breast and also in her abdomen. There was a bunch of puncture wounds. Pretty brutal. Yeah. I mean, she she suffered for sure. But again, I mean, these guys, they're not showing any mercy. No. I mean, they're not, they're killing in very, very vicious, brutal ways. Uh, there's one that I want to talk about that, you know, I did, I found interesting. And that is the disappearance of a woman named Carol Pappas. That's a pretty fascinating story. It is because Carol Pappas was the wife of a Chicago Cubs p- pitcher named Milt Pappas. But Carol disappeared on September 11th, 1982. Her body would not be recovered for five years. And at that point, I think the death was ruled an accident. But there was a lot of speculation, I think, at the time that she could have been involved or could have been one of, one the, of the victims, one of the Chicago uh, Ripper victims, but ultimately it turned out that, that she wasn't. There's also another victim. And the only reason we know about this victim is, is because Spritzer talks about her, um, but they never find the body. He doesn't have a name. So he talks about her after, the, after the, fact. after the fact. Yeah. But it's around that same time that, uh, the previous victim was talked about, but I guess the victim was picked up, blindfolded, gagged. And then for whatever reason, Robin shot her point blank in the head and put chains around her neck and legs and a bowling ball or two and And, threw her in the water, which is nowhere near their Right. And and there's another big difference here because this victim is African-American. She is. And all the other victims to my knowledge, were white. But to me, that is such a departure, right, from all of the other victims and incidents that we've talked about. You know, different type of victim, different type of killing. It it, it really is completely against or, you know, a complete 180 from their uh, M.O., and maybe this was him trying to take some of the heat off of him during his plea and try to put the light back on to uh, right, Robin. We, ultimately, we don't know if what Ed, Ed Spritzer is saying is correct. Right, exactly, but exactly. It is interesting. But it's, but it's mentioned, so. All right, so let's get to the, the final victim. And this is a woman named Beverly Washington. I read that she was a sex worker and she was found by a railroad track on the 6th of December. Now she had a lot of injuries. Her left breast had been completely amputated. So we're, we're back to talking about the left breast, right? But her right breast was also severely slashed with a knife. Yeah. Like the other women, she was raped. She was, tortured but unlike most of the other women gibbs she actually survived this attack and i they had to believe she was dead oh i believe that they did with what they had done to her i think they dumped her body um she was naked they dumped her body on these railroad tracks and i they had to have believed that they thought she was dead but she survives and she's able to give a description of the attackers and also the van that they used to abduct her. Yeah. A really good description of the van. Yeah. And, and, and the, the plywood uh, divider 
right, of the bulkhead of the van. Yeah, and, and really, it's Beverly Washington that leads to the the ultimate downfall of this Chicago Ripper crew. You know, without her surviving this attack and being able to give, you know, these detailed descriptions, their atrocities would have gone on much longer. I think that's pretty safe to say. Yes, I agree. So, again, she survives... And some of the details that that she's able to give, like you said, are pretty miraculous. Yeah, that she remembers all that after what she went through. Given what she went through again. Yeah, right. I think you're right. You hit it right on the head because she's able to say that the driver was a slender white male, looked to be about 25, was wearing a a flannel shirt, square toed boots. Guy had a greasy kind of brownish hair and a mustache. Even went as far as to describe the, the interaction, um, you know, he had offered her more money for sex than what she even asked for. Okay. This is where we start to find out some really good details of what happened to her because, you know, she says that she's forced into the van by gun at gunpoint, at gunpoint ordered to remove her clothes. She's handcuffed. She's forced to perform some sexual acts with the individuals in the van. And she's threatened with violence. Also, she's made to swallow a handful of pills. And I think that's where, you know, getting back to the the woman that talked about drugging these people. Right. That's some great information because it leads back to what you and I were talking about. How in the world would they get some of these these women to do what they get them to do or to even be compliant. And that's, that's not even the right word to even not put up what would have to be a vicious struggle. Yeah. And I think it's done by these drugs. It has to be. Yeah, exactly. It keeps them immobilized. So she's at the hospital Like we said, she survives, they save her. She's able to give all these details. And it really is within about the next three weeks that the police are there. They pull over a red van and question the driver. This guy has red hair and doesn't fit any of the description that Washington has given. Right. But the van fits dead on to a T. Yeah. Perfect. Now the driver tells them that his name is Eddie Spritzer and that the van belongs to his boss, Robin Geck. The officers take Spritzer to Geck's house. They have Geck come outside. When Geck comes out of the house, he does fit the description. I mean, really fits the description. He's wearing the same damn clothes. Yeah, I mean, she did an amazing job describing him because they say... There was no doubt this was the guy when they looked at him. Right. Based off her description. From what I understood, he may have been still wearing the same the shirt. Same shirt and boots, everything. Greasy hair, mustache, all of that. So obviously they're they're questioning him. And Gek acts like he doesn't know what the heck they're talking about. He doesn't seem nervous in the slightest way. And By all accounts, he's almost arrogant with these police in saying that, why are you even talking to me? Right. Uh, I don't know what the hell you're talking about. But something happens, Gibbs, and that's that Beverly Washington is able to pick Gecked out of a set of photos and positively identify him as the man who had assaulted her. So they arrest him, but they don't have him for very long because they just don't have enough evidence to really hold him and connect him to any of these crimes. Yeah, so they have to let him go. Yeah, all they really have is her saying, her positive identification that this is the guy. Now, after they let him go, that's when they start putting some of the pieces of the puzzle in place. And one of the first things they learn is that he and three other guys had been renting 
some rooms at this uh, this local motel. It was called like the Rip Van Winkle or something. Yeah, what a name of a hotel. Yeah, but, in Villa Park. In Villa, so I was again, say in Villa Park. We're still in Villa Park. But they had been renting some adjoining rooms at this Rip, Rip Van Winkle just months before Linda Sutton was murdered. And again, if we go back, that's the very first murder. And we know she was murdered pretty close to this area. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So they're they're tying that in. Now, the hotel manager, when questioned, said all kinds of stuff about them. You know, they were throwing big parties. He even said that he thought they were in some kind of cult. Well, he was right. Well, he was right, but <laughs> I'm not sure how he knew it. But obviously their behavior was must have been pretty crazy. And then the police catch another break because two of the men, and it's actually the brothers, Thomas and Andrew, they, they had left a forwarding address at the hotel. So they must have been there long enough to get some mail. That's crazy. And when they leave, they leave a forwarding address so that the hotel can forward their mail. So another tip for the police doesn't take them very long to track them down. Obviously they just go to their new address and they find Thomas at home and they start to question him. He's given them some really bizarre, inconsistent answers. They track down the two other guys, Ed Spritzer and Thomas's brother, Andrew. They got them all in for questioning and they've got Gecht back again. So basically all four at this point. Right now, Gecht, he, this, he's older. Like we said, he's the oldest of the four. He doesn't give them any information, but Spritzer is the one that is looking like he's going to start to crack and they're leaning on him pretty hard. It was said that he was, he acted like he was genuinely afraid of Gecht. And I think all three of them were that, that that would come out at some point, but they are leaning on him and he finally breaks Spritzer does. And what it leads to is a 78 page statement slash confession. So Gibby, I think we have to spend a little bit of time on this 78 page statement and confession because it really starts to lay out some of the facts. Yeah. I mean, the first thing that Spritzer does was admit to driving the van at one point in time while Get committed what was essentially a drive-by shooting in which a man died and another one was paralyzed. So this, again, doesn't have anything to do with what we've been talking about, which is this weird cult, cult sexual fetish type thing. This was just them driving around. Shooting just, random people. Yeah, just random murder. Right. But they, you know, he confesses to that. And then he also confessed to what you had talked about earlier, which was that where they had picked up an African-American woman and they had tied chains to her and used bowling balls to weight her down. Shot her in the head. Shot her in the head. This is the one that, again, it, it doesn't fit any of the other things that we talked about and there was one incident that Spritzer talked about and again keep in mind he's laying the blame on Gecht and this is very important for everybody to keep in mind but he says that Gecht killed a woman by with a hammer by repeatedly striking in her her in her head and this was such a sight that it made Spritzer vomit and I'm not shocked because Earlier, one of the victims, her, you know, she was beaten so bad that her face was crushed in. Right. Right. So clearly, Gek or, you know, didn't have a problem doing this. No. I mean. So I'm not shocked by that. I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Gek had no conscience, I don't believe. Maybe some of the other ones did, but. Yeah. Uh, or maybe they're just saying that to make themselves look better as part of the confession process. But again, I mean, there's all kinds of other, you know, more sexual contact and 
and having sex with gaping wounds and, and just some really sick stuff that comes out in these 78 yeah, pages. From, from masturbating onto the wounds to actually having intercourse with the wounds. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, you know, that Robin made them have intercourse with the open wounds. Well, and, and that's the thing. That's what this whole case is going to center around, right? You've got three people saying that Robin Gecht is making them or directing them, forcing them, whatever you want to call it, and that they're just uh, puppets. Yeah. Pawns. Right. And Robin Gecht saying, I don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't do anything. So by the time that, that Edward Spritzer is done, he's basically laid out all the details for seven murders and one aggravated battery in this 78 pages. I don't know why it took 78 pages, but... It's a manifesto. Yeah, that seems like a lot to get through there, but... So now they got to take this information, and they got to work on Robin Gecht. So they get a bunch of photographs of these known victims. They throw them on the table in front of Gecht. He looks at them. No emotion, denies knowing any of these women. Doesn't know who they are. Doesn't, has never had anything to do with these women. And Geck knows at this point that Spritzer has implicated him. But he doesn't waver, not one bit. He's not even close to cracking. And at one point, I think they even take Geck to where he can see Spritzer. I don't know how they accomplished this, but they can see him. So Geck knows for sure that, hey, Spritzer's working with us. He's talking to these guys right now. He's giving them all the information. Yeah. This is your turn to give us information. Maybe we can make a better deal with you versus him. Yeah, it doesn't have any effect on Geck. Yeah. But what it does is it has a very weird effect on Spritzer because obviously Spritzer can see him too. It's not a, a one-way mirror, right? They can see each other. Yeah. And... What happens is, as soon as Spritzer sees Gecht, he completely changes his story and says that Gecht was not involved, did not murder anyone, and he changed his story so much that the detectives had no idea what was real and what wasn't. So again, we're talking about cultish power. Oh, absolutely. It's a strong power there. The... They weren't even in the same room. And he still had the influence to get him to flip his story. Right. Just the mere fact of him having seen him caused him to change his story completely. And it was a huge mistake on his part. There's no doubt because he changes his story and starts talking about Andrew and Thomas, Thomas and, you know, all these other people that were involved too. Right. And Gecht is asked about them. He, he doesn't, he, he does, he just acts like he doesn't even know what they did. Yeah. I wasn't there. I don't know what you guys are even talking about. Why am I here? Yeah. Th- to me, the guy's unflappable. That's what I'm getting yeah. from this whole yeah, thing. He's a stone wall. But w- the one thing they are able to do, Gibbs, is they get Thomas to confess. Yeah. They, they did get him to confess. And he was able to say that, you know, him and the others, had taken women back to Gek's place, which was called the Satanic Chapel. The Satanic Chapel. Yeah. So back at the chapel, they would rape the women. They would torture the women. They would, um, this is where they would take, you know, several, you know, take the piano wire or knife or whatever they were using to have the breast removed. They kind of, did a like a sacrament with the breast where and this is really weird man geck would ha- he and sometimes they would all masturbate onto the breast and yeah. then when they were done masturbating on the breast they would cut the breast and they all would eat part of the breast right so we've gone we're we're cult we've got a cult we've got the satanic ritual let's call it that involves circle jerk thing breast going on with breast jerking off on a 
a several, removed breast. Yes. But now we're into cannibalism. Yeah. Now they're now they're eating part of it. So it's bizarre, man. I know we it, we had to talk about breasts so much in the beginning because it, it play it, it it plays into everything. Yeah. And, and, and to one point that Thomas even says he remembers seeing a box full of about 15 breasts at one point. So Gex saving these breasts. So that they can complete this satanic yeah. ritual. And we know they always he always liked to take the left breast. So I don't know. Is that breast from 15 different women? Who knows? We don't know. I, I don't know. You know, it's claimed that they murdered 18 plus. Yeah. We don't have all those victims. Well, and that's, again, Thomas ultimately kind of almost inadvertently as he's confessing, ends up confessing to 18 deaths. Yeah. Now he's implicating others, but he's implicating himself, himself. as well. Yeah. And that's going to, like you said, that's going to come back to, uh, to backfire on some of these guys. But, right. you know, one, one of the ones that uh, I really had a hard time with, you know, we talked about Sandra Delaware. And one of the things that Thomas confesses to is shoving a large rock into her mouth so that she could not scream and raping her with a wine bottle. I mean, and the autopsy confirmed all these details. So yeah, brutal. They knew that he was not making this stuff up, but the, the crimes that these four committed against women are just atrocious. Now I do want to play another clip that talks about the breast ritual because again, it's central to this case. They would go up into Robin Geck's little attic and they would kneel around the table and Robin would chant whatever chant he wanted to sort of ritualize the scene to give it a semi-religious significance. They would then masturbate into this breast and then cut it into pieces and eat it. A little bit of what you already talked about, but yeah. I like the fact that there was chanting in the background. Yeah. Makes it sound not that it ne- not that this case needs to sound more eerie um, or ominous. ominous than it really is, but I mean this this one's bad. And and they, and they talk about that in, in, in the uh you know when the detectives take the statements and stuff. If he talks about how he read sometimes some statements or chants like from a Bible or not really the Bible, but from some readings that he had, his cult readings, and he some would, type of satanic. Yeah, and he would chant those as as they did different things, different torture, different um, the masturbation, the sex, all that kind of stuff. One thing we haven't talked about is apparently Tommy had a pretty low IQ. I read that he was even labeled as like slow witted. And I think I saw where it could have been as low as like 76, which I feel bad because you're at 78. You're 78. So yeah, I shouldn't have said that, man. I really made you feel bad, but well, now, you know, but anyway, (laughs) you know, I, I don't think they had a hard time getting Tommy to confess, but they also had, like we said, they had autopsy. They had all these other details to back up and to match what he was saying. So it wasn't like some of these stories you hear where detectives are coercing somebody with a, a lower IQ into saying what they want them to say. Right. I think, I think he basically said the truth because they were able to back that up, you know, but so Gibbs really getting back to the satanic part of this, you've got Robin Geck, who's the leader. You've got three guys that essentially joined a cult. And, you know, if if you remember back to the eighties, this is the time of satanic panic. If you remember, there was a lot of things back there then where parents were saying, you know, coming out against the rock music. And, oh yeah. Black Sabbath. Yeah. You know, the, I shouldn't say rock music. I should say heavy metal. Heavy metal. Makes me sound like I'm from the fifties. Yeah. This damn rock music shaking their hips. 
but this was a this was a thing in the eighties where teenagers there was some satanic worship. Oh, absolutely, there going was. on. Yeah, for the most part, teenagers weren't taking it to this level. Actually, I don't know of anybody that took it to this level. What they did was definitely off the charts. I mean, it's it ranks up there with some of the. I mean, we had some really sick. Bastards. Bastards. Yeah. But this is up there with them. When you're talking about basically eating human body parts, and in this case, I think it was mostly cut up pieces of breast. Yeah, breast. And they were using that as almost like a satanic form of communion. Yeah. I mean, that is over the top. It's just the whole thing's messed up, you it, know. It the, really is. Uh, serving a platter of breast with semen on it. I don't I don't know. That's weird. You think that's weird? Yeah. <laughs> Overstated, right? But Geck had a major fascination with breast. Oh, he did. I mean, he he wanted to know how they worked. He wanted to I mean, early on he had a fascination with breast. You know, there were some comments made from some previous girlfriends that he would want to stick a needle in the nipples. He would want to have them cut off their nipple. Uh, I think even one said he, she did cut off her nipple in fear of him. He was so fascinated with, with breasts. So he, he tells a reporter, you know, the reason he was, was basically because it was a thing that his entire family you know, was fascinated with going all the way back to his great grandfather. And di- didn't he say something about his whole family was large breasted or he something? He did. He said, he said each of the men in the family married large breasted women. And he talks about his ex-wife having 39 D. I guess that's big. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you guess it is. <laughs> Sounds big. <laughs> Gibby doesn't know much about breasts. No. So he talks about his ex-wife is a 39 D. And that, yes, she was uh, very satisfying to him. So, I don't know. That's where his fascination with breasts come from. And Robin also talks about that the reporter, you know, she asked him about having sex with the breast and his obsession with the breast. And he basically says, you know, only a sick person would ever have sex with a breast. That's what he says to her. Right, because he's playing it off. He's playing yeah, he's playing it off. So and then at the same time she tells him about how his partner Spritzer claims that Robin once became so furious with his wife that he did cut off her nipples. But again, you know, the wife his wife at the time, I'm assuming she's still married, you know. I don't know if she ever divorced him later or not. No, they. But they she were, stands by him. No, they 100%. were married, and that and that's one thing. I mean, he was doing all of these things as a while she was at work. Yeah, you know this satanic chapel that he he had in his house. He would have to wait till she would go to work, and then get the guys together to come over and do their weird and go up in the attic and yeah, do their weird stuff. That's really. Oh, clearly she never went up and looked in the box. What's in the box? Yeah, what's in the box? Don't open the box. Don't do it. <laughs> Love that movie. All right, so let's get back to Tommy just for a minute because obviously they, they've got confessions from a number of people. They don't have a confession from Gecht, right? He's not breaking. He's still a stone wall, man. But all the other ones have told him... Every all these different things that they've done, and they put Gecht in the middle and really as the ringleader of all of it. And at one point, the detectives asked Tommy, you know, why would you do these things? And his reply is basically that Gecht had the power to make them do whatever he wanted. You just had to do it. I mean, that was a quote. And he believed that. I think they thought he had Gecht had some kind of supernatural or otherworldly power. Right. And they were afraid 
what would happen if they didn't do what Gek told them to do. Yeah. So the two brothers, Spritzer, they've all laid out everything that happened. Gek's not saying anything, looking, you know, still innocent in his mind. But either way, I mean, they're being, at this point, they're held. Yeah. They're being held on a million dollar bond on a whole host of charges. So at this point, there's a series of trials, right? They all go on trial. Thomas is convicted of murder, but he only gets life. And one of the reasons is because he confessed early on. So I think they looked at him as being very cooperative and they took that into account. Now something happened though, after that, and his life sentence was commuted and he's actually scheduled to be released later this year. Yeah. How about that? That's I think crazy. September. Yeah. Maybe he'll listen to this and tell you what he thinks about Why it. Why are you always wanting people to listen to this and reach out to me? I just want to see if they ever do. Once you reach out to Gibby. No, no. No, no. And tell him. Just remember, Gibby's got a K-bar. <laughs> tell him how you feel about it. Now, Gecht was tried. And they never got him on murder. They could never pin a single murder on him, even with all the confessions, all the testimony. Now, he got 120 years. So that was good. That was good. But it was basically the only thing he was convicted for was the attempted murder and rape of Beverly Washington. And obviously, she's the one that survived and ultimately put him away. But again, he's going to be eligible for parole in 2022. Yeah, so he'll be eligible. But I bet if Beverly Washington's around, that she'll be at that parole hearing and do everything she can to make sure he doesn't get parole. Well, and I, I think not just Beverly Washington, because I think there are a lot of women that came forward after the fact. Yeah, they did. That weren't. Obviously, they were victims, but to a different degree. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They from were, his past, yeah, right? Yeah, his past where he, they were tortured. And, right. and so hopefully some of those women come forward as well. Um, I don't think anybody wants to see this guy get out because I think you and I both agree all four of these guys did some crazy shit, but Robin Gecht is the... Oh, he's a ringleader. The ringleader. He's the one that made it all happen. I can't say he made these guys do that because I don't know if I agree with that. But he definitely... I think he orchestrated it for sure. Yeah. Maybe it's safe to say that the other three guys may not have done this without him. Okay. I can I can go Can with you that. get behind that? Yeah. Because I think that's probably what I... In yeah. my heart, I believe. Yeah. He was the motivator. Edward Spritzer, he was sentenced to death. But his sentence was commuted at the last minute by the governor of Illinois in 2003. Now, Andrew Gibbs didn't fare as well as Edward Spritzer because his death sentence was actually carried out and he was executed by lethal injection in March of 1999. Not exactly sure why he was executed four years ahead of Edward, but it didn't work out well for him because... Yeah, because Edward gets the death penalty pulled off. Yeah, he gets commu commutation or, or right. whatever you want to call it. But Andrew, who was killed, he has, he has a, a pretty big distinction. He's actually the last person to be executed in the state of Illinois. Because in 2011, they completely abolished the death penalty... And apparently, I think there was something like 15 people on death row that all got changed to life in prison without the possibility of parole. And I think they, there's some articles that talk about the reason that was the change that came was because of Thomas and Andrew and, the, and their being part of the Greek Orthodox Church. You know, that that church rose up and took the fight and tried to get the uh, death penalty out of the state of Illinois. So I don't know if that 
you know, how much they actually had to do with that, but that was some of the story, the backstory to it. I, I think it played a part. I don't know, you know, how much of it played a part, but are we in Illinois or Illinois? Well, it depends where you're from. <laughs> he said Illinois again. It always cracks me up. All right, Gib, so let's play a, a clip of Robin Gecht. I've been fighting since 1991, actually, but they had standard testing for rape kids, and they refused. This lawyer who was the part of the defense team showed up at the county jail and said a friend, quote, sent him to represent me. What did he do before he was a attorney? He was an ex-cop from the same police station that arrested me. There was no biological or physical evidence linking me to this crime at all. Just her word. So obviously he's saying, I didn't do it. Woe is me. And I think there's... Trying to dispute what Beverly Washington said about right. it. Yeah, and, and by all accounts, I, there wasn't a lot of evidence against Robin Gecht, obviously, because he wasn't convicted of any of the killings. Yet it was his van, right? She describes a person that looks just like him. When she's presented with a picture of him, she pulls a picture out of the lineup. But I just wonder how much evidence there was against all four of them because had they not been able to get confessions, would they have been able to convict the other people? Yeah, and I don't know if they would have been able to. That's the thing. So. Right. He's he's the one that didn't confess. He's the one that basically played it as, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. He did all the way to this day. And I was going to say, he continues to do it to, to this day in interviews and basically saying, you know, I don't know why I'm here. I didn't have anything to do with this. It's just it's just one of those things that, uh, I mean, today it'd probably be a whole lot easier to prove some things with DNA, you know. I mean, when these women that had these guys having sex with their open open wounds, right, and putting duct tape over it, talking about easy DNA. I mean, that's talking about preserved DNA. I mean, they. Yeah, you're you're. I think you're. You're right there because we are talking real early 80s. Yeah, it really wasn't a, a technology. The science wasn't there like it is now. Yeah. So I think what we have left to talk about is the aftermath. And there's some very strange things that happen after all the trials, after everything is kind of... We call that karma? Said and done. There is... Well, I, I don't know if it's karma... Because it happens to people in Gek's family. Okay. So unfortunate events. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't want to call it karma because. Yeah. I don't know that these people had anything to do with it. That's true. But his mother and his sister and his nephew were all involved in a car crash while they were visiting him. That's strange. In 1988. And basically what happened is they got sandwiched between two semi trucks somehow in a traffic jam. Maybe he uses satanic cult powers. Maybe he wasn't happy with them. I don't know. It's really strange. It ended up killing his mother, who was 57 at the time, killed her grandson, who was Gek's nephew, who was just three years old. Oh, man, that's sad. Yeah. Gek's sister, Rochelle, was the one driving the car. She was on life support for three or four months, and then she finally died in April of 89. She was only 29. Yeah, that's rough. So, again, as far as I know, these people didn't do anything. Right, it's right. Just a, it's just a unfortunate event. Kind of a strange story after the fact. Right. That happened to his family. But it doesn't stop there. Because in March of 99, Gek's son, David, along with two other guys, they actually shoot somebody. And they get charged with first-degree murder. And this one is a little different than the car crash. His son actually kind of ambushed a guy. Similar to the way that maybe Robin Gek ambushed some of these women he attacked this guy from behind it, by all accounts it was unprovoked and they thought it was gang related 
but there again, does that have something to do with the DNA? Yeah, the way the way he was raised, the way that uh, who knows? Yeah, I don't know. Nature, nurture. We talk about that from time to time. Yeah, we do. I can't imagine that he was that David was raised very well. So did he get prison time? Yeah, he did. You know, he was only eighteen. Okay. But he was tried as an adult and he was found guilty of first degree murder. He's actually serving a forty five year prison term in Pontiac, Illinois. So he didn't get to reunite with his dad at the prisons together? No, they're they're at different um correctional centers. So no father son time. No no father son bonding time. Yeah. But that's it. That's the story of the uh, Chicago Ripper crew. You know, again, I don't it, know that any of the ones we do are more gruesome, but they there's there's different facets, and they all have their their different ways of being gruesome. And but this one was rough. It was rough, and, 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 and like we said, and Geck still says he's innocent. He made the statement that. I don't only I don't only face the injustice, but the nightmares that follow. You have no idea the pain and the hurt that I face and feel every single day I sit here and lose hope. I'm not an angel, but I never intentionally hurt anyone unless it was to protect myself or my family. I can never live with killing or knowing I was responsible for taking one's life. That's what he says. Yeah, and I just don't I don't buy it at all. Yeah. I mean, there's too much evidence. Why would these three people say all of these things that match up with actual autopsy and and real data? Yeah. And right? a, and and a victim's statement. Statement. Yeah, there's there's just way too much here. I know there wasn't enough to convict him of the murders, but my gut is telling me that there's no doubt he's involved. He's the ringleader and he's exactly where he needs to be. Now, one thing is, and we have, I have one more clip to play because it's an interesting clip. Cause I, you know, I think we talked about the fact that there was at least 18 women that were probably linked in some way to the Chicago Ripper crew. But the question is, how many more could there be? There could be fields out there somewhere with some woman's body in it that we will never know about. There simply was no way to, there was not even any way for them to remember all of the women that they had killed. So it, it absolutely is my belief that there are more victims out there. These were horrendous crime scenes. The women were hacked with axes. Several of them were beaten, their faces were beaten desperately, terribly. But in every case, every single one of them, their breasts had been slashed. And this was no sort of surgical type procedure. And in most of the cases, it was not post-mortem. Um, the women were still alive. A little clip there to leave you with. But but the main thing I took, Gibbs, is the, is the beginning part where... You know, really, if you think about it, how many more people are out there? And we could say that in a lot of these cases. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, these perpetrators get caught for a certain number. They get things pinned on them. But you know that doesn't mean they're telling the whole truth. And it definitely doesn't mean that the police are able to figure out everything that's attached with them. No, they can never do that. And that's, uh, you know, that's the one thing that that I kind of think about sometimes is, you know, just how many of these unsolved are tied to the solved, to the serial killers that we talk about. Well, sure, because a lot of times you hear people tie in Gacy, people tie in these other well-known serial killers that all oh, that. It was probably them, or they actually look in to see if it was them, right? Because they could have been, they were in the area. Yeah, right. I mean, how many times, I, I mean, I know that you, you're you really familiar with the Zodiac. Zodiac was 
you know, used in a lot of different unsolved that it could have been the Zodiac. It's sure. You know? And, There's and, no doubt. So it's easy to, to, to pin things on others if you don't know. So. Again, assume everybody's a serial killer. I do. Look out for yourself. So I drive around now. So. <laughs> All right, everyone. That's it for this episode. Definitely make sure you check out True Crime All the Time Unsolved if you haven't yet. And if you like this show, please make sure you go out, give us a five-star rating on iTunes. It really helps the show and helps other people find us. So for Mike and Gibby, this has been True Crime All the Time. Stay safe and keep your own time ticking.